subject to me because it's one of the things that we've done in the Diamond History and Art Society is add to the body of knowledge about the history of Diamond. If you read all the books about the area, all the history books about the area, you won't find anything in them about Joseph Weaver. And yet the fact is he was a revolutionary veteran. We know where he lived. We know his family. We know where his, what his last resting place is. And we know quite a bit about his life and his service in the Revolutionary War. And so uh, we're very happy to kind of gather that material together based on source documents and to present it to you and to the town of Dartmouth as, as a result. So tonight we're going to be talking about Joseph Weaver, his family, his home, his service in the, in the military, and his resting place. And I have a disclaimer. This is just a stock photograph. I don't know what his uniform looked like when he fought. He probably just had a bunch of yeah, well, basic overalls or something that the fight it. But he, uh, he was a revolutionary soldier. So next slide, please, Don. Uh, I, I think it's appropriate for us to be talking about this subject right now, close to the Independence Day. Independence Day is we celebrate the, the freeing of the United States from Great Britain, which was happened as a result of the success of the revolution. And he was one of the local soldiers in the revolution. So it's appropriate for us to learn about this. Next slide, though. Let's talk about his life. Next slide. He was, according to his, he gave a deposition in order to get his pension. They, they put him in, in a courtroom and swore him on, on, on oath to, to testify and answer questions. And he recorded what he said at the, at the time when he applied for the, for the pension. And here's what he said. He said, I was born in Troy, in the county of Bristol, in the state of Massachusetts, in the year 1758, 29th day of January. Now, if you notice, I got the 9th January up top there. That's my typo. And I fixed it on one of my slides, that, but that I don't have that slide set up. But I would like to ask somebody in the audience if you know where Troy is. Forever. Yes, forever. Forever, right. Forever. right. So forever. And later on, he says he lived in Tiverton at one time. So if you, if you know the present day boundaries of Fall River and Tiverton, you go from one to the other if you just go down, down the street. Next slide, please. His first revolutionary service, he enlisted. And he served, he started in 3 June 7, 1776 at another place with an old name on it. And this, is, again, is from his deposition. He was 18 years old when he went in. And he served at Howland's Ferry. Now, Howland's Ferry is known by several other names. Howland's Ferry is where um, Daniel Howland ran a ferry boat over to Rhode Island from what we know as Stone Bridge, at Stone Bridge area of Tiverton. And so that, that was called Howland's Ferry in the old days. Next slide, please. After that first term of service, he was drafted back for two or three months at a time, many times. And I, I'm not going to go through every time. It's in his deposition, which was available on the website, will be available. But his last time was in September of 78. And that's when some of the action took place, which we'll talk about later on. Next slide. In 1787, he filed his marriage intentions. And he got married on 25 of January, 1788, at 30 years of old, marrying a girlfriend. Freetown named Sarah Bryant, and we know who her parents were, and I forget their name right now, but um, all we have the facsimiles of the original documents, all these, these uh, events. Next slide, please. Some, some other events in his life include RE grantee means a real estate grantee, means he bought, he acquired real estate in the town of Dartmouth in 1788 from guy named William Allen, who was the son of Philip Allen, and he paid 18 pounds because they were on the, the English system in those days. And he got 20 acres, 18 pounds. When I was working at the Foxboro Company, a pound was worth about two and a half dollars. It's not two and a half dollars anymore, but you get, get an idea what you pay per acre there. It's pretty cheap land. You'd like to buy something for that price now. 
We know that he was a resident in Westport in 1790 because we kind of record the first census in Westport. In, in 1792, he, has another, he, he bought some more land in Westport this time from Lyakum Mosher, who lived at that time in Dutchess, Washington, Dutchess County, New York. A lot of uh, Quakers from our area migrated to western New York. And uh, there's a lot of migration of Quakers all of the years out, out to the west. And that part was that was west in those days. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know that in 1798 he was living in what we call today the Weaver House uh, in Dartmouth, Mass, because it was mentioned in the 1798 a dated newspaper advertisement said that he was living in that house. And we know that in 1805, he bought from Lemuel Barker, whose wife Mariah Tripp Barker uh, was part of the deal, he bought the dwelling house and 50 acres in the, in the description near a stake by the pond. And you'll see later on how where this is located and so on. Next slide, please. I am not going to overdo the sources thing, but as a historian who believes in trying to find the truth, I try to get the original documentation, and I have citations for all of it, but just for now, the, those facts on that last fact sheet uh, were footnoted. You probably didn't notice the footnote. BCLR stands for the Bristol County Land Records, which are available in FamilySearch.com. And if you learn how to use all that stuff, you can find the actual written deed and extract from it what you want. And so that's where we get, we got three of those pieces of information, the Bristol County land records, one from the federal census, which you know is online, and one from newspaper clipping, which was also online. You have to find it. And when you find it, then you tie it in with what you have. Next, next slide. Okay, let's talk about his family. I'm not gonna get too deep into his family because his family, that they all passed, the, they're all gone. His family's all gone. As far as I know, no descendants. Uh, next slide. He had six children, born from 1788 to 1802. Edith, Thomas, Sarah, and Sylvia, David, and Joseph. We know a little bit more about a couple of these people. Next slide, please. Of these six, we, the only one we have any evidence of, of a marriage is David. And he married a woman with a very different name. Um, her name was Philadelphia. You don't know many people named Philadelphia. I don't. Philadelphia Cowan, whose father was Abishai, and her mother was Hope Chase, probably one of Donald's relatives, Cowan. And they got married in 1833. Her, her short form of her name was Philip. And on all, a, lot of, a lot of the records, all you see is Philip. But her real name was Philadelphia. They, they had one son. His name was Joseph A. Weaver, obviously named for David's father, Joseph Weaver, the revolutionary veteran. And he lived from 1840 to 1869. We have a record that he registered for the Civil War uh, at the age of 23. He died at the age of 29. And he's, he and his mother and his father were all buried in that family burial ground that is part of this presentation. I think he died from the result of the Civil War, but I don't know that. And I, I don't want to make the assertion without telling you I don't know. Next slide, please. Let's talk about his home, his house, his domicile. Next slide. I'm going to try to answer basic questions. We find the fact that his house still exists and that he was a revolutionary veteran from Dartmouth is a very significant thing. It makes the house a historically significant house. We're going to talk about the history of the property and a little bit of it. Who lived there, a little bit of that. With help from some of my friends. Jim Costa supplied all the information here from his research into the original records. Where is it? And does it qualify for plaque? You know, we have the Dartmouth History Commission, Historical Commission puts plaques on some of these old houses. Does it qualify? Next slide, please. So where is it? This is, a, it gets kind of interesting about where it is. Next slide, please. We all know where Dartmouth is in the county of Bristol, the state of Massachusetts. This is a nice outline map, very useful for these kind of things. Next slide. However, 
not everybody knows where the campus of UMass is. And here it is in North Dartmouth, off of Old Westport Road, not far from the junction of the Crossroad and Old Westport Road. Campus begins. Next slide, please. And this is what the campus looks like now that it's built up. And uh, now I'm going to use my fancy fancy thing. This is the Ring Road, so called, with all the different campus buildings and the house. Campus housing, we have our cheering squad at that. This is the ring road, goes all the way around. This is the Cedar Dell portion of housing. And over here near the pond, this is Cedar Dell Pond. This is where the house is, right, right here. Now, next slide, please. We'll, we'll see a little closer view of the map. This is a drawn map, not a photograph. That's Cedar Dell Pond. This was a barn at one time, it's not there now. But the house is right there. That's what we call the Weaver House. This is housing, student housing, and a parking lot and so on. And you come out here, that's what you see. We go back one down, back out. Sorry. Give, give you an idea of this. How, I live in a house on Alden Avenue, right over here. The other ice house that Jim talked about a couple of weeks ago. That burned down was on that little peninsula right there. Mr. Lightman lived over there. The, uh, the King Fat Farm, Ellen, Ellen Petavino's family lived right about in there somewhere. You'll see this on another map later on. Okay, next slide. And the next one. Okay, what does the house look like? Well, it doesn't look like much. It's a little old house you now, and it's been kind of abandoned for a while. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like before the campus was built. The state of Massachusetts took the land from various uh, abutters. And this farm at that time was owned by a family called Zela, who operated a, farm, a dairy farm at that place. And that's what it looked like in the 1960s. I uh, had the experience as a kid in the 40s of delivering newspapers to this house. Uh, I didn't really bring the newspapers in during the week because it was too far off the road. I left them in a box of, at Lucy Little Road. But when I had to collect, I had to go in here to, to collect. I'll tell you more about that later. Next slide, please. This is another <coughs> shot that shows one of the outbuildings that's not there anymore. But that's, I think, where they filled them. They, they refrigerated the milk and they filled some other uh, product that they distributed. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like last year, two, two years ago. I took some pictures. There's some storage bins back here. This is kind of a junk area um, for the university. It's, the, the, the modern housing is right there. You can see that. This is the house. The Zales brought up 12 children in that house, by the way. <laughs> they, they were a little crowded. Don't they? they fit more than one to a bed. Next, next slide. <laughs> Now, this is the laneway off of Lucy Little Road. Uh, the credit for this picture is Jim Carson. This is another one of Jim's works. And I still leave the mail out here, not the mail, but the paper. But when it was time to collect, I had to go up the lane, and that's the house up there at the end of the lane. And Mr. Zela, all every time I collected, he would tip me, but more than the tip, he would give me a great big piece of dark Polish rye bread with peanut butter on it. You've never been a 12 year old, 10 year old kid. That, that was uh, like gold. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is another angle. There was a, there's a little L on the house there. I'm not sure what they did. And then uh, I, I, I'm yet to get a good interview with the Zillas and get room by room descriptions, but this is what it looks like. Next slide. And, uh, this is kind of a pretty slide. This is the end of the L with a little brochure. Uh, 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 Jim, Jim's pictures, he's done a lot of good stuff that he's done. He's one of the unspoken heroes of our group. He, he provides a lot of research, doesn't take a lot of credit, but he, he deserves a lot. Next slide, please. Another, another shot. And then the next one. Okay, what's the history of this property? Well, we've got quite a lot of data, including deeds and uh, advertisements in the newspaper in the 1790s and so on. Next slide, Donna. We have a deed that tells us that Lemuel Barker and his wife Mariah Tripp Barker owned it 
before 1805. They conveyed it uh, in 1805 to uh, Mr. Weaver. It's not clear when the house was built. We, we have some clues, and we could probably make some assumptions, but make, make sure we identify them as assumptions and not facts. Uh, we know that when, this is a fact. Barker married his wife, Mariah, in 1793. Weaver was living in the house in 1798. It was a newspaper advertisement I'll be telling you about. So I, I'm concluding that Barker probably built the house for his bride around 1793. We know it was, it was existing in 1798 because uh, Joseph Weaver was living in it in 1798. So that's as close as we can come so far about the age of the house. Okay, next slide, please. This is the actual wording of the deed from 1805. And it's, it's pretty legible. I don't know how good your eyes are. Why not that? Know all men by these presents that I, Lemuel Barker, Dartmouth in the county of Bristol, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, yeoman, in consideration of $1,000 paid by Joseph Weaver, the town, County Commonwealth of Forcer, farmer. The receipt where I do hereby acknowledge, do hereby convey, grant, sell, and convey unto the said Joseph Lever, and to his heirs and assigns forever, a tract of land with a dwelling house thereon, situated in Dartmouth, Forcer, containing by estimation about 50 acres, either same, more or less. And all the privileges and pertinences thereunto belonging. Da, 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 da. You've all read these kind of deeds. There's a lot of, lot of belonging besides the facts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've been talking about this advertisement. This was, I'm not positive, but I believe it was in the New Bedford Mercury. And it's dated, see, it's dated June 12, 1798. The old kind of typeset um, has some words that look like something or not, like that's the word yes, yes. For, terms for, for terms for sale, of sale. So I took the trouble to translate the old type to the, to the new type, and I'll read it. For sale, farm, consisting of about 200 acres, well proportioned with wood, meadow, and pasture land, lying on the road, leading from the Bedford to Holland Ferry, about one mile from the head of Coxon River. There are three dwelling houses on the farm, which will serve to accommodate the purchaser or purchasers with three handsome farms, and will be sold together or separately as may be best, as may suit best. There is also one barn and other convenient outhouses with two orchards on the premises. For terms of sale, I 
Thank you. 